How's it going? So this will be the third video in the FPGA driven LCD series. Um, previous videos you can find below. Um, this will move from the blinking of an LED with a button into doing the um, repetitive uh, blinking of, L of LEDs. So uh, enjoy the video and uh, keep watching. So the next uh, the next thing to work on with this project was to use a counter to make the LEDs blink. Um, so this is kind of the code for this. Uh, to do that, it's it's a little choppy here. Like I say, I'll, I'll link a lot of this code down in the, in the bottom to my GitHub account. Um, but we'll just kind of go through this one line at a time, or two lines, depending on how it's put together. So module counter, we're just kind of starting this module. Um, we're, it's called counter, and that's one of those things that you got to be uh, specific about. When you call a module counter, it needs to be saved as counter, right? Um, so we're giving it an input of clock, and then we're giving it an output of LEDs, right? And so this is kind of the same exact thing that we were doing before, just kind of reiterating. Uh, then we're making a register, right? And it, it it's called reg, and I think of register, but it's actually putting you know these registers together. Um, and I'm making a, actually there's an error there, I'm making a 26-bit register, right? So I'm doing 25 down to zero, uh, which is 26-bit. Now we've got an always loop, this is kind of a new thing. But it's kind of a, you could think of it as a, as a repeatable way to do things um, where it's not a straight tie. So this concept, I know that just sounded confusing, but let me get this concept across here. Um, when you're working with an FPGA, you're literally wiring things together or unwiring things together, or at least that's the best way that I can find to think about it, right? So when I did the assign statements before and like this LED assign statement you see at the bottom, I'm literally just assigning uh, one spot or I'm wiring one spot to another spot, right? So if I just had the assign statement like I did before, it wires that button directly to the LED with an inverter as, as it was, right? Um, but if you took out the, the tilde, then it would just wire it directly and you would have this button connected to that. Um, with an always loop, you're now, you're now injecting a, a register in between the two and you're taking account for time, right? So something happens, I give it a clock tick, and then something else happens. And it's, it's, it's making this synchronous um, thing happen so that it's not just a spontaneous thing. So if something spontaneous is happening out in the outside world, like say I hit a button, uh, I can now synchronize that to my clock so that I can bring it into my environment in a timely manner and have things happen um, according to my clock count. And now we can also use that to string multiple uh, registers together so that every clock count something you know moves from one register to the next. Um, and if you're working with digital logic right now you know how important that is where you can move you can do you know and or nor gates and put all these things together to, to make interesting things happen. We're not going to get deep into that right now if you want me to do that uh, at some point or make maybe make a series of that we can do that um, just let me know below um, so I've, I've introduced this always at and what I'm gonna do is say that all these registers that are tied together they're tied together in a string and so I'm gonna say that count equals count plus one well count is this register so I'm taking that that bank of registers there's 25 or 26 registers there uh, and I'm adding one to those so that very last bit will be one and then it'll move over to the two and the one will be zero and then it'll move over or and then the one and, and the two will be one and you know so on and so forth just as if you were counting a binary well these registers essentially you can view them as a binary line right so when you're talking about like 32-bit windows or something like that that means that you can put 32-bit registers in that that bus path and it'll pull into all those registers. You can't put 33, there will be nothing on the 33rd. If you put 31, you're gonna lose information, um, but there's 32 there. So that's what I'm doing here. I've got 20 fit, 20, 26 bit register count. So there's 26 bits there that I can work with. Um, and what I'm doing with the always loop is I'm just adding one to that every time. And I'm making essentially a clock or a counter that counts from zero up to the top of uh you know whatever 26 bits would be let's see what that is uh 
So we'll say 26 bits is 2 to the 26 minus 1 would be your total top number. Um, so that's 67,000, I think. Let's see. 2 to the 26. Yeah, 67 million, 108,864. So that would be the total number that you could count up to. Um, no, the total number of numbers, the total number you could count up to would be 68,863. Um, but yeah, that's another general dis digital systems topic that we can cover later on um, if you so request. So we're just counting that counter, counting it up. Once it hits the top, it goes back to zero. All the bits are zero. And then we assign the top bits of that, or in this case, it's actually 25 down to, um, let's see, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, and 18. So 25 down to 18 are going to are gonna be represented on our LEDs uh, down at the bottom. Now we use, if you want to know what the actual timing of that is, you have to look at your clock, right? The clock that's run in, and then you have to look at your counter, and then you can figure that out from there. So the, the formula down there below is basically the clock frequency, 50 megahertz, divided by the number of bits. So the top bit uh, is 2 to the 25, right? So that means that you'll get uh, that last, that 25th bit will blink every 1.49 seconds. Or no, you'll get 1.49 blinks per second. So that's a, a frequency. If you wanted to know how many... Um, how many seconds it would take to blink, then just do one over that, you'll get seconds per blink. Um, so yeah, what we wind up getting is these all of these LEDs because they're all tied to that one thing. There's this, there's the, uh, the braces there. So if we include these braces around say eight, then count 25, what we're doing is we're actually, we're actually taking and making eight of that one bit, which is count at 25th bit, right? So count at the 25th bit, we're gonna multiply that by eight, so we're gonna not multiply it by eight, but we're gonna make eight of them, right? So now we're gonna fill in LED seven down to zero with eight bits of count 25. And that's what those braces do, right? It just kind of gives you a, a multiple of the same thing. So now when we do that, if we look at the frequency of that, if you wanna know the frequency or how often that happens, um, then you would take the frequency of the clock coming into the FPGA and divide that by the total count, which is uh, 2 to the 25, right? And if you do that, then you get 1.49 blinks per second. So a little bit more than one blink per second. If you want to find out how many seconds per blink, you know, how many times, or, or in other words, uh, how often this thing blinks, uh, then you could do one over 1.49, uh, which we can do real quick. One divided by 1.49 uh, would would be blinking every 0.67 seconds. So it's it's just a little bit more than one blink per second. Um, so that's how that goes. Um, let's see if we can get that to show. So this is it blinking. It's going to blink that uh, at that rate, right? So the next thing, once we get all these things to blink, we know we can control all of them, and we know we can control them with a counter. Um, so now we can we can actually give a rate at which this thing will blink, um, and it's it's a pretty specific rate when you consider that my finger can't can't be very uh, precise with you know every one second or every 0.5 of a second. So it's an actual controlled synchronous blink. So the next thing that we need to do, um, or the next thing that we do, is uh, we make the LEDs blink separate eight-bit codes in sequence. So we had this and this always at. We can make it blink at a certain time, and it was all synchronous. Now that we have it synchronous, we can kind of tie it down and start flashing different patterns at different times, which is preparing us to be able to flash different patterns to the memory um, to be able to load these codes, and when I say memory, you, you load this code into the memory of the LCD and it picks it up from there, right? So we still have this, we have this kind of the same stuff going on here, we're just kind of adding into the center of it. 
so we still have the input clock we still have the output LEDs um, we have the register for count and now we've got a new register for our code now I kinda this is erroneous but I kinda think of registers in this way um, like a, a variable um, but really it's best to think of it as we talked about earlier where it's uh, it's you know it's bits it's literally bits and you know when you get down to it you can take these bits and do and or nor or all that stuff to do things with but for this actual application I think of this as kind of like a variable so these registers are just going to hold, hold my code the code that's ultimately going to go out and in this case be flashed on an LED but ultimately be put into the memory of the LCD so always at we got this new always at block or sorry the same always at block um, it's always at the positive edge of the clock and it's going to and it's going to do this same counting thing so we're going to continue to count but now we're going to use that counter to do different things at different times, right? So we can we can count up to a certain amount of time. We know how much time in literal literal time, like 1.49 seconds or whatever, that it takes, or 0.67 seconds that it takes to match different points on this clock. So we can actually mark a time um, now that we have that. So we use that counter for that. Next is a case block. Um, if you are absolutely new to coding altogether, this may be a new concept. If you're not, then this is just the same old sort of case block that you've seen in, in C or, uh, or many other languages. MATLAB, Python, all these guys have case statements. And it's basically a way of condensing if statements, right? So if this, then this, or if this, then this, else do this, right? Um, well, a case statement, just it's, it's like a memory map. I can just say, I have all these different cases, and this is what I want to happen in each different case. So I'm going to give the case, and I'm going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to use for the variable for this case or for the the thing that I'm looking at in this case is going to be count from 27 down to 25 so I'm using the 27th 26th 25th bits three different bits that I'm looking at if you have three different bits then you can have two to the third two times two times two eight I can have eight different codes right so that that would be one two three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Because, uh, what is it, four plus two plus one is seven. Uh, so I can have, sorry, zero. That's that's where I often get mixed up, and I think that's where a lot of you will get mixed up. Especially because I came from an environment, you know, I was doing engineering, um, engineering school, and I came from the MATLAB environment, which has this, this different indice problem. Um, but you'll figure that out if you ever have to deal with that. So it starts down at zero. So if I've got uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, that's eight different codes that I can have. Um, so I'm just using five of those codes here. And as you can see, if this if the case if this count is ever zero, then it's going to put out this code. Uh, and the way to read this is if count twenty seven down to five is zero then code, then shift in that 8-bit sequence to code. Um, so kind of to back up a second, remember earlier we talked about you know the 27-bit 0, that's just going to be 27 bits of 0. Well, you can actually go in and name each bit. So if you look at the 0 line for code, you're going to have 8 bits. So 8 apostrophe B is 8 bits, and I want these 8 bits to be 0, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Zero, zero. Um, and then in the next case, in the next case is one. So if the count 27 down to 25 is one, then I want to shift into code eight bits of one, eight bits that are one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. Um, and when I'm saying shifting in, remember these are registers. Code is a seven or an eight bit register, seven down to zero. Um, and there are we're shifting those bits in at that clock count. The always block happens at the positive clock. When that positive clock happens, count will be a new number, and we'll check that number. And if that number is zero, one, two, three, or four, or not, if it's zero, one through four, then we're going to put in the codes for zero, one through four. If it's not, we have the default case down there. We're going to just shift in zeros. So now we have this register that's holding these codes that we're sending it to sending to it um, and then of course we end the case we always want to keep a default 
case, especially in VHDL, you got to have something to fall back on. Um, and I think some compilers won't even run it if you don't have a default. I may be wrong there. Um, but you always should have a default case, right? So if it's zero, we'll have that. If it's one, we'll have that. If it's two, three, or four, we'll have these codes. If it's five, six, or seven, then it's just going to be zero. Um, and so during those times, you should see you know, uh, one code, a different code, a different code, a different code, blank, then a new code, a new code, new code, new code, new code, blank, right? And all that is going to be timed properly from the 27th bit, from the 27th bit down to the 25th. So if you look at this from a different perspective, if we watch that 25th bit, that one's going to change every single time. So since that 25th bit changes every single time, you're going to change the code every single time. Um, now you may be changing it back to zero through some of those cases, zero back to zero, but every 25th time it'll change. So you can kind of get your timing down now. We know from previous that it was like 0.67 seconds, I think, um, that, the, that the actual lights or LEDs will blink or that 25 will change. So every that many seconds, this code will change. So we'll have, you know, points, point 0.67 seconds, we'll have the first code, 0.67 seconds, we'll have the next code, next 0.67, next code, next 0.67, next code, next 0.67, next code, and then the five, six, and seven, so three spots, three times 0.67 of just zeros happening, and then it repeats. So we just have a repeating sequence, but it's different every time. Uh, and that was an important concept, it was it's kind of a barrier or the next milestone to get through uh, to be able to move on to coding an LCD. So at the end of that always loop, inside of that always loop, we have all the things as we talked about before that are changing with time. Uh, you have registers that are going to be updated. Uh, they need that clock to be able to change. Um, outside of that block, now we now we want to set our wires, right? We want to wire things together. Um, wire may be the wrong word to use here um, just because of the the actual word wire or a keyword wire that you can use uh, in FPGAs. But essentially all I'm doing is I'm, I'm making a connection outside of that that doesn't have anything to do with the clock, um, which means that you can use combinatorial logic, right? Because you don't necessarily need a clock to say um, and or, right? Um, so anything outside of the clock or anything outside of the always loop that looks at the clock, I'm just doing assignments. So the very last thing on there, I'm assigning LED seven down to zero to equal what code equals. So that any time code changes, it's gonna change that uh, those LEDs. So let's see how that works. Let's see, we've got the different flashing patterns. And it turns over. Now, of course, when I when I made this, it doesn't have the, the period space in there, but it would insert right there, right? Um, so yeah. Now, now that we can sequentially change um, the code or change what's output, um, of course, in a repeating sequence, now we need to do that in a, in a non-repeating sequence. And this is just the next logical step, the next the next uh, milestone, if you will. So this will get us really close. In fact, it'll bring us right up to being able to code uh, the FPGA for the LCD. Um, now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and break for the next video. I think we've already got up to 16 minutes or so, a little bit past that. Uh, sorry for stretching it out too long, but it was important to at least get through this part. Uh, so we'll see you in the next video. Don't forget to love well.